welcome. This is episode, I don't know, of Fill the Gap podcast. Um, I'm your host, Cody Allen, and today I have my friend um, Blair Orr, the founder of the Lead Performance Gym here in, you guys are technically in Rockland, or you guys are in Roseville? Roseville. You guys are in yeah. Roseville, right on the cusp of it. Yeah. Um, we met a little bit ago now, but uh, I had known about Lead for the longest time. Um, it's kind of crazy. I was just talking to somebody recently um, who's an ON athlete, too. We were talking about not necessarily legacy, but kind of like what you're known for. Yeah. He played nine years in the NFL, um, studying to get his MBA, and he's also he was on The Bachelor twice, The Bachelor oh, and then so. Bachelor in Paradise. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because people come up to him and they're like, "Oh, like, I know you from The Bachelor. I know you from The Bachelor. I know you from The Bachelor." And he's like, "Fuck, man, I had like a whole decade in the NFL and whatever." Yeah. So now I just introduce you as the owner of a gym, but like, yeah. you played professional basketball, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's so funny because we spend as athletes so much of our life being um categorized and identifying with just the athlete that we were yeah um but before we get into it this podcast is sponsored by cuts clothing i'm wearing a cut shirt i'll give you a cut shirt um cuts best men's and now women's um athleisure work leisure uh, apparel brand i think out on the market um i've turned a lot about girls over to them they're like i didn't even know that cuts had women's stuff their stuff fits the best feels the best especially for guys that are have like a more athletic build um code the cody allen and you get 15 percent off hey, I'm, so I'm anyway in, if, if i'm starting to look like you if i throw a shirt on the whole thing like is, you, is good like, I, so i played with a, i played with a dude um in college he was six seven played yeah. tight end receiver for us yeah um and he wears cuts but he's like man like they're a little little short at times depending on the cut that you get yeah but so many nba players but wear cuts yeah what size shirt do you wear XL Perfect. or 2X. And that's the problem. It's like if I don't get athletic cut shirts, all of a sudden I put on, on, on an XL, I put my hands over my head, and it turns into a crop top. No yeah. one's trying to see that. See, that's the whole thing. <laughs> uh, so, Blair, tell us a little bit more about yourself, how you ended up here yeah. in Roseville. So, and in, in, in exactly like what you're talking about with categorizing yourself, when I was playing basketball, whether it was in high school or college, one of the big things was everyone – Everyone wanted to be more than a basketball player, more than a basketball player. And I always categorized myself as exactly that. And, uh, you know, it, so it's, it's really interesting that now people know me as, you know, the guy who owns lead performance right. or, or for all these other things. Um, when I stopped playing basketball, I got right into performance training, training <clears throat> high-level athletes, professional athletes. Um, and LA is just that place. Like LA, if you want to train professional athletes, LA is the place to be. Because yeah. every professional athlete wants to be in LA for the summer. And uh, why is that? Is that just a weather thing? It's a weather thing. It's a fun thing. I mean, thing. you're talking about like you can, yeah, you can go. You got the nightlife. You got the beach. Um, yeah. It's it's just kind of everything's there for you it's to go enjoy your off season, but still get great training. And not be in like Green Bay, Wisconsin. It, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And uh, you know it. There was this there was this point where I was in LA interning at a at a place that only did professional athletes and I had to make the decision. My wife's from Roseville, born and raised. Um, had to make the decision to take that leap of faith, move up here. And uh, you know, still we still took the same methodologies, it's still the same style of training, just yeah. into training the athletes that were here. Because there's just nothing like what we had in LA. Right, yeah. And that was I'll, I'll touch I'll touch on the LA thing and like what like sent you into training versus being a pro basketball player. But yeah. one of the first things is that we had a conversation. I talked to you. I know you weren't fucking dumb because <laughs> I'm very like particular about my training and then yeah. especially with referring people to trainers. People always come to me and like, hey, Cody, train me. I'm like, yeah. I'm not a credentialed trainer. Yeah. I would never take money from training for somebody. I've trained myself, mm -hmm. right? I don't even have – I train – I have a coach now for the event that I'm running. Um but I get a lot of young athletes that come to me, right? Yeah. And that was why I sent Mahalis to you. Yeah. Remember? Yeah, because yeah, I was like, Blair, or <clears throat> Blair, you know your stuff. Yeah. And so that was great. Obviously, Mahalis, good job. He got a scholarship. Yeah. Smart kid. He always, I felt like he was always going to get one, but he got one, one and done. Yeah. Um, But uh, so you saw a hole in the market, the business side yeah. of it. You saw oh, a hole in the market and yeah. you just saw how I, I personally believe I'm not from like the Sacramento region, but I do think there's a lot yeah. of talent here. Oh, absolutely. Um, I only know like the football side of it, but, uh, it's just good that there's an outlet for kids here that are maybe a little bit like the high school, like the junior high, high school age yeah. range, because 
I've seen it for like the younger kids. I just feel like a lot of the the high school kids are getting lost in the wash. Yeah. Not to say that strength coaches aren't good at the high school level, but I know that mine wasn't. Yeah. This is a, a million years ago now, but yeah. still, I think that's good that you found that. But um, you said that you made the decision to start, that like you are as new, that there yeah. was life after sports, and you yeah. went into that. But you were like a COVID, you were a victim of like uh, leagues getting shut down, right? Is yeah. that what kind of like pushed you into yeah. I was, I was I was in China when COVID broke out. So it's your fault. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> so no, so, so I was in China and, you know, couldn't understand what, what was going on on the news. So I had so many people from back home calling me, hey, you got to come home. Uh, when everything just got shut down, just night and day difference, got out of there. And uh, Was your wife there too or was she back here? I tried to get her over there. She didn't. She didn't. She's like, no, I'm not going. <laughs> not doing it. And uh, But when I came back, there was, a, there was the same exact jokes. There's a lot of jokes about, oh, you brought COVID back. Oh, yeah, yeah, Well, then yeah. I start, like, March comes around. You start looking at, like, where the cases were. Like, the first two cases, L.A. and Sacramento. I'm like, I, I started to think, like, man, there. maybe I did. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so that's, COVID was this really, really interesting opportunity where I was working at a gym that was just really small, intimate. We would only worked with one athlete at a time. Um, and so with with covid it just it made sense uh to to continue to train through that through that period of time coaches kind of get a bad rap as far as from yeah. the training programs yeah like kind of being stuck in the ice age i mean shit my coach my it was a little bit different my football coach fucking ran the triple option i played court, triple option quarterback so we yeah. were like this is back when everybody was running starting to run the spread and yeah. we were still running the triple option so i get it from like a football standpoint but i didn't know that it was yeah. like that with strength coaching and it's it's hard because it's not incentivized financially, so if that's a big motivator for you, there's you go and you get another certification, you get continued ed, uh, education, you go and get a master's degree. Oftentimes, in a lot of the different sectors of this business, you're not really getting that much mo- more of a pay bump, right? right? Unless you go and you get a really high level certification, and then you uh, really implement it in a way that is uh, serving maybe at the college level, if it's really serving that population, you're bringing something new to the table, maybe. Uh, but a lot of times, if you look at the high school level, what's what's the incentive? You know, right. the, this yeah, coach yeah. is getting four thousand dollars as just for being a coach for the year, right? He's going to be a head coach. He's got all these other responsibilities. What's the incentive uh, for going and continue to educate yourself and, and pouring yourself into being a strength coach? So. It's, it's not, I don't think it's necessarily fair to point the finger at, at high school strength coaches. Right. Uh, but that's why, I think that's a big reason of like why that, that stigma is out there. I mean, I've always heard and thought like teachers aren't paid enough, right? Yeah, yeah. You always hear that, but like we never talk about how like coaches aren't paid enough, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, a lot of them, I mean, on the roster when I coached, we were all volunteers, right? Yeah. Which was kind of the standard. But then like... Now that you put it this way, like you think about paying teachers more so that they are higher qualified and can provide better education. It works the same way when you talk about coaches. Cause yeah. I didn't even think about like, you're not incentivized to go get more because your job isn't really hinging on that. Yeah. Unless you have like yeah. an AD that's like, Hey, all of our kids are weak or all of our kids are getting hurt. Right. Um, but you're better off because of all the tasks that a coach has, like especially a head coach, right. just hiring having yeah. somebody else come in, maybe yeah. a JUCO student or whatever, coming in and doing it. But then it's yeah. not the best of quality, right? No. Um, I'm a huge advocate of, especially for like high school kids, like <clears throat> there is a stark difference between a high schooler that is on a good training program and one yeah. that is not. Like yeah. there are so many kids that kind of look out of shape and aren't really strong and let, let alone not strong, but aren't powerful because power yeah. – is huge at least in my sport yeah um because you see these kids that put all these i squat 600 pounds like no you don't yeah yeah yeah. they're on a four three i haven't i've seen so many four threes now in high school i was like what the hell is going on like all these kids that are putting up these numbers but then on the field it's not there um then they go up and play against a team from la they go and play a team like that's in the bay to have these kids that are on these programs and they're getting steamrolled you can really see it in the front seven yeah um one thing I want to touch on is uh, everybody deals with adversity. Yeah. I would probably say athletes more than most people because yeah. we all have adversity from life, but then we throw ourselves into these impossible situations, right? Um, 
what are some situations that you kind of face as an athlete and what did you lean on? Did you lean on your faith? Did you lean on your wife? I don't know how long you guys been together. Like, yeah. like obviously the decision to stop playing total mind fuck, right? Yeah, I'm sure yeah, you guys yeah. had many conversations, you know, but yeah. even younger than that, man, um, going back to your college years, like sitting on the bench, like I've talked about the the highs and lows and how blue chip players just rise, right? Yeah. They're in high school. They're probably the best kid on the, on the pop Warner team. Yeah. Then they're in high school and they're probably the best kid on their varsity team. And then they go from there and then they're probably a first year starter at an SEC school. And then they're a top round draft pick. Those kids are very rare. Oh, absolutely. The percentage of those, right? Most yeah. people were an okay Pop Warner kid. Then they get good. And then they suck on their freshman team. Then they get good on varsity. And then yeah. they suck on their college team. Yeah. And they get good again. Some people just never even rise again. But what, yeah. what's a little bit about yours? So mine, um, I ended up, I, I fell into the, the transfer portal, uh, both in high school and college. Looking back at it, I wouldn't have changed anything, but I definitely would have talked uh, an athlete out of transferring because it's just so common now. I'd rather an athlete transfer because they have a, a certain situation that they can't get out of. Yeah. Um, if it's going to best suit the player, then great. But otherwise, fighting that adversity is going to set you up for the real world situations that you see as soon as you're done playing. Yeah. It's like that as soon as you're done playing that, that real world hits you. Um, and so I, I transferred in high school and in college. Um, so down I went, L, you were down in LA in high school. Yeah. Okay. So I was in Oxnard, California at a high school that had 300 kids. I okay. transferred to a school that had a thousand kids per grade, a huge difference, right? It's like socially just a, you know, huge, huge, uh, shift I had to make. Was that to get onto a school that was better at sports? Exactly. Yeah. So we were, our, our basketball team was high, high level. We had six guys um, who went on, played Division One. Was it Oxnard High? So I was at Santa Clara uh, High School, okay. which is in Oxnard, small, small school. And I went to El Camino in LA. Okay. Uh, it's in the Valley. And so that team went on, won our section championship, right? All these guys, they're all going over to big schools. And then I was the last person on the team to kind of figure out what they're going to do for college. And I ended up going to Canada and I was in a program that thoroughly believed in playing the older players who have more experience versus playing the, the players who are trying to prove themselves, trying to play really hard. And this is university? Yeah. And I saw that as something that at the time I didn't think I could overcome. So I left. Right. right. I wish I would have fought through it a little more. Um, but when I got to Northridge... I left a scholarship to go be a walk on it at Cal State Northridge, right? Division one university. Great. You have that tag, but I wasn't playing. I had a redshirt a year and I went two years of not playing because I was playing under guys who were higher level than me. We're talking about, you know, guys from Texas A&M. They were the guys that we just talked about. Yeah. 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 They're, they're these, these phenomenal athletes and I wasn't a phenomenal athlete myself. And so, you know, going through that, I found a community that supported me at Northridge with my family, with my hometown. Um, and that's what I relied on to, to get me through a lot of that. Last year, we got a new coach, really set up uh, this, this family-like culture. Had a, had a great last year. I always try to think in life by like numbers. Yeah. And so you always say, like, <clears throat> should I try to go for that job? Yeah. Like, well, there's a few other people going for it and your numbers aren't this, your numbers aren't that. Um, should I try to start this business? Yeah. Um, yeah. Athletes are dumb because we will see all of the odds stacked against us and we're yeah. like, we don't care till. I remember the Cleveland Browns used to have this thing up in their locker room or whatever and it was like, Basically, the percentage of kids playing high school football that received an athletic scholarship to a Division One school, yeah. it's like less than a percent. Yeah. And if you, if I were to walk in right now and I was like, hey, Blair, like, give me four years of your life and yeah. less than 1% of a chance, you're going to get 150 grand and all the success and notoriety that you want. Yeah. You'd be like, well, those aren't good numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'll do it. Yeah. Right? And yeah. that's kind of how... 16 17 18 year old kids work and then even to look at the college level it's even a smaller percentage yeah but um it's tough as an athlete to look at somebody and be like hey you shouldn't try to do this because you can never really count 
anybody out. Well, you, a lot of the and, things and in you, life. And you got to take the human element. There's a lot of people, so exactly what you're saying, there's a lot of people that will look at all these things stacked against them and say, oh, well, that's just adversity I have to fight through. Right. You know, so it's hard to get that filter over or between, you know, what do you actually have to fight fight through and what is a closed door that you say, let me, let me look for the other open doors. Exactly, yeah. And there's always opportunities that are allotted. And, and I think that's what a, a smart athlete, like if you talk about the athlete as a business and a career, yeah, yeah. ones that are like, all right, cool. I came here as a four-star quarterback. I put on some weight. I yeah. was a pro style quarterback and now we brought in a running gun option OC. Yeah. Am I just going to throw in the towel or can I go play slot receiver? You know, you see like yeah. that all the time, right? You see yeah. that like old school receivers and stuff, but, um, all right, man. Uh, so, so, so before we wrap up the, you brought up work-life balance and that's one thing that I, that I tell a lot of people. I'm just, I'm really passionate about the fact that I think work-life balance is mis misconceived by a lot of people so a lot of people see work-life balance as balancing their time before between their rest and their work their you know their play and their work or whatever it is that that that's actual uh life that you can categorize as life i think a lot of people categorize as that as time right when it's really it should be categorized as the the energy that you put towards uh that and i think balance is just not the best word for it I think it's a terrible word. So you'll never have a balance. You'll never have a true there balance. There shouldn't be a 50-50 split no, between it. absolutely. There's, there's no way to do that. And it sets you up for this, you know, unachievable, un, unattainable goal of trying to have 50-50. But was, if you look at it really linear, you look at work-life balance as a scale, where am I comfortable? For me, I will bury myself in work, right? That's, that's where I'm comfortable. It's what I love to do. I love to work. I love my business. I'll slide that scale over as far as I can to the point where my wife has to be like, hey, we got to move this back over a little bit. Right, right, right. You know, I have somebody <clears throat> to help check me in that. But I think work life is much more of a scale. And you got to choose where you're on the scale. And again, if I'm way over to life on that, on that sliding scale, whatever my goals are might be pushed out a little farther. I think that it also is important to realize that this almost works like a teeter-totter right like yeah. i think that as different points of your life come like i tell people all, like all the time like i started my company in 2017 and i was working till 3 a.m and that's what i had to do to get here at 31 right yeah now i've afforded and earned the opportunity to shift my energy and my time in other places right yeah. a yeah. lot of people are like oh well you know like i don't like working on the weekends i'm like well neither do i yeah but yeah, i did yeah for a long time. Yeah. And I do now still, right? Yeah. Cause I'm yeah. still only 31. Right. And I think that if your goals are larger than the rest, I always tell people this, like if you want above average, you have to put an above average effort. If you want something great, you have to put in a great effort. Yeah. And I think a lot of times people see people putting in average effort, not realizing that their life is average to them. Yeah. And it's yeah. all relative. Yeah. It's all what they want. 100%. Um, but that work life balance is crazy. It, it's, it's interesting. Cause like right now I account for myself. You yeah. have, how long have you been with your wife? Uh, just under a year. Just how long year. have you guys been together? Seven. So seven you guys have been years. together. So you, she's been yeah. with you through a lot of a the lot. poor work. So you guys a have lot. found what works for you. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's why when it comes to relationships, when it comes to business, when it comes to teammates, I think it's so fucking essential that you have a partner. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It kind of sounds, we didn't touch too much on it. Your wife is your partner. So she understood. Yeah. She's been there when you were upset thinking about throwing in the towel in your career. She's been there when you're struggling, thinking about, oh shit, how am I going to keep the yeah. door? I'm taking a leap of faith. I'm going to start my own business. You know, yeah. she's been there when she was dragging you up to Placer County away from LA. Man, you know, she, she's been with me through almost quitting in college. I almost, almost quit. I almost right. walked away. I, I made a risk assessment, pros and cons. It, it wasn't worth it at the time. I almost quit. She's been with me through almost quitting the business. And, and so it's, it, I mean, it's vital. It's, it's vital to, to have somebody right there with you to, to bounce that, all those ideas off of, all those emotions, everything. Yeah. And sometimes it's just to be there to help you pull you back to the life balance of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, hey, you're getting a little testy with your, you're putting too much of yourself into this work yeah. and it's taking a toll on you. Yeah. Let me reprieve you from that for a bit. Well, and a lot of people, a lot of people who are that person for somebody else, they feel like they have this responsibility to have this solution. One of the biggest things I've learned in the last year, 
listening to people. Like it goes so far. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you some sometimes that person just needs you to listen. They don't need an answer. It's not on you to to solve all their problems. It's just they got to get it out. They got to explain stuff to themselves. They got to say it out loud. They got to get through their feelings. They got to tell somebody. So just being there to listen for someone is huge. Yeah, I talked to my therapist about that. She said that was like a big thing in my relationship because I'm a solutions guy. Yeah. And my yeah. girlfriend, she was always like, she got a problem. I got an answer. Easy. I'm yeah. like, here it is. And yeah, she's yeah, like, yeah. I don't want to hear an answer. I just want to tell you about something that I'm struggling with. Yeah. Right? Um, but I think it works the same way with guys because we're like very pretty poor at being like, um, hey, I need help or something's bothering me. Yeah. So all my boys, same thing. I'm like, I just want to listen to your shit. I'm not always going to be like, hey, you could do it because I don't want you to feel like inferior anyway or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think it's a big thing. Obviously, you can always tell me shit. Yeah. I may not have yeah. any or the answers, but yeah. I always listen. Um, tell us where we can find you because we're about to cut yeah, out. Yeah, man. At Lead Performance on Instagram. That's our biggest uh, biggest outlet. Anyone can message that. Uh, it'll go to me or anybody on the team. Our website, Lead Athletic Performance. Um, we have TikTok, Twitter, all the good stuff. Good stuff yeah. Um, and yeah, we, we try to be as much of a resource to, to anybody. Um, any questions, anything, whether you're in Lincoln, Roseville, uh, or Rockland, or out of the area, we're, we're here for you. I urge if you are a parent or an athlete in the greater Sacramento area, contact them, get some advice, come out, train. All right, y'all. Thank you. Perfect.